much. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, yes, so as, as Tracy said, I'm, I'm uh, Lena. I'm, I'm working at um, University of Manchester, uh, and I'm currently working in a team that is developing um, Pulsar software, Pulsar backend for um, the SKA telescopes. Um, so I will button. See if I can make this work. Um, give a little a little overview of my talk um, today. So I will start by giving a um, short introduction to to radio astronomy with interferometers, um, and move over to to talk tell you then about um, more about the SK telescopes uh, in general, uh, and then because I am a pulsar astronomer, pulsars is, is, is really my expertise. Um, I will then tell you a little bit about what pulsars are and what fast transients are, and then move into what we can do with the, will be able to do with the SK telescopes um, within pulsars and, and fast transients. And in the end, I'll give you a little um, 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 uh, view on what we think, how many pulsars we think we might be able to find um, with the SK once it's, it's finished. Um, so the in the electromagnetic spectrum, um, uh, you can of course observe um, all all across the spectrum uh, for to to, um, to to observe different things within astronomy. Um, but uh, most of the spectrum is is basically covered from um, the Earth, um, where. Um, both the, the infrared part of the spectrum and, and up at, at higher wavelengths, um, high, higher frequencies, sorry, uh, shorter wavelengths, you will um, do gamma rays, X rays, and ultraviolets. All of those are more accessible from space rather than from Earth. Um, but the, the radio waves, um, um, the radio waves uh, can be can observe from, from, um, uh, Earth uh, in a in a wider range, um, as well as the, the, the visible light uh, has a little window there uh, uh, where we that we can see from from Earth as well. Um, the visible light, as I'm sure you know, has uh, some atmospheric uh, distortion where it can be hard to observe. It's cloudy, so you have to have really clear skies, and most um, most um, of the the telescope and the optical wavelengths are high high altitudes, for example, so that you can get away from the atmospheric um, distortions. And um, you also can only observe at night. And um, well, at radio waves, you can observe pretty much any time of the day, any time of year, um, through most weather. So um, it, it's a accessible way of observing for us we can we get a lot of time to observe um the, the only things in the, there's some things in weather that, that we can't do, observe through like um thunderstorms it's not very good and, and high winds can be a problem um but but this is the the, the window that that we would be um, observing in, in the radio waves um so um, radio astronomy was born in the 1950s, um, and uh, soon after we started building large radio telescopes, many of them across the world, there's a, a few of them on this slide. Um, so for to, to um, observe in the radio, you need to have a large dish, so the larger the, the dish, um, the better the sensitivity. Um, and um, the um, uh, the dish you see up the top left there is the Lovell telescope that um, that I use a lot um, in my uh, my um, work, which is uh, located at Yodel Bank uh, in in here in the UK. Um, the middle picture, in the top middle one, is um, Parkes telescope where I did my PhD. Um, and then there's the, the green bank. Uh, there was a, a 100 meter dish that unfortunately broke and collapsed in the 80s. Um, they have a new telescope at the green bank site now that's um, also 100 meters meter dish. 
Um, the one at the bottom left is is one of the largest, or was one of the largest, the Arecibo telescope, which uh, was a 300 meter dish that also unfortunately broke um, two years ago, 2020, and one of the the, the focus cabin um, fell down and, and and broke the dish. The bottom right one is an F, the Effelsberg telescope, which is a 100 meter dish in, in Germany. Um, and there, there's more more across the world. Um, but how it works is that the, the radio waves hit the, the dish and they, they get focused into the focus cabin as it's in the middle of these dishes. Um, and as I said, the, the larger dish you have, the better your um, sensitivity. Um, but at some point you get to a point where you can't build a larger radio telescope that is in one single dish. Um, so um, another way of, of, of doing radio astronomy is with interferometry. So radio interferometer is um, a lot of smaller dishes that are correlated um, in the, the signal from the dishes are correlated. And um, you can use them to get, and get a higher sensitivity um, than you would be able to with a with a single dish. Um, so the the sensitivity is proportional to the the distance between the longest distance you can get. But also by doing an interferometer, you can get a finer resolution on the sky. So with a, a, a thing in a single dish, the resolution, so the spatial resolution you can observe um, is uh, proportional to the wavelength divided by the the dish size, um, and then an interferometer is instead proportional to the to lambda over um, the baseline. Uh, so that baseline is the maximum distance between um, between the two of the maximum distance between two of the dishes, um, and then you can correlate the signal that comes into the telescopes, in, and and that's how we we get the extra sensitivity. So doing this um, with, uh, using radio interferometers, um, astronomers started um, imaging the radio sky. So um, using radio imaging to to find um, more things um, uh, in the universe. Well, with the close by universe, but um, the top left. So both of these two plots are of a close by radio galaxy called um, Cygnus A. It's one of the brightest ones that we can see in, in our sky. Um, and the, the top left plot was, a, it was a, uh, an image from 1969, where it's one of the earlier um, observations of this radio galaxy, where they could start to see um, these, this um, um, double um, structure that you can see there. Um, and you did, astronomers started to find more and more of these um, in the sky. Um, and the top, the bottom right one is a more modern, modern, but from the 90s, from the, the very large array in, in the US, um, where you can see the same galaxy. Um, you can see the radio core, um, the jet that comes out of, of the galaxy and then the lobes that, that you could see in the, the other image as well. Um, this is how, how much the, we've been able to do, um, to add to our knowledge over that time. Um, the next image I'm going to show you is from, um, going to be from the Meerkat um, array, which is located in South Africa. And it's one of um, the precursors to the SKA telescopes. Um, so this one is an image of the galactic center, so our galactic center. This was their Meerkat's um, first big um, press release, first big um, result from, from the Meerkat array when it um, started a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, it's amazing how much detail you can see in this image and how much you can use it um, to it, it shows um, really what you can do with the, with the radio um, array. So this is a 64 antenna 
array in um, South Africa. Um, so that's that's radio imaging um, and and radio astronomy in general. Um, so I'll now move on to talk a bit more about more detailed about um, the SKA and and uh, what we will be able to do with that. So um, the construction of the SKA telescopes has started just last year. Um, it's been a long time coming. It's been in a phase where we've been um, preparing for it and it had a long design phase, designed all of the, the telescopes and the back ends and, and um, the processing pipelines. Um, but it's recently started actually being constructed. Um, so there's going to be two telescopes, one in Southern Africa and one in Western Australia. And the one in, in Southern Africa that we call SK Mid and the one uh, in Western Australia is called SK Low. And that refers to the observing frequencies that they will be operating at. Um, and it's a it's a global effort. So it's, it's a lot of countries involved. I'll show you a map in a second about um, which, which countries are involved so far. Um, but the global headquarters are at the Jodrell Bank site in the UK, so up here in Cheshire. Um, and it's the, you can see that in the, in the picture there in the middle, you can see the building just next to, um, next to the Lovell telescope, which is, is um, so it's on the same site um, at the Jodrell Bank Observatory. So I'll go into a bit more detail about what the different telescopes uh, are. Here's first this, this map of the, the the countries that are involved. So there's um, members, so it's, um, it's, it's 16 member states and partners, um, and then another um, eight African partner countries that are involved so far. Um, it's a different amount of involvement in, in the different countries, but um, it's um, it's a real true global effort. Um, where different parts of different countries in the world are focusing on, on developing different parts of the telescope. Um, so this is a uh, sorry that the, the, the are some some smaller text on this um, slide, but the the details that I wanted to to show you is um, this is for the SK mid telescope. So that's the one that's going to be located in South Africa. Um, it is going to have a frequency observing range from uh, 350 megahertz to up to 15.4 gigahertz. Um, they're gonna be consisting of 197 dishes and that's including the 64 that is uh, already part of the Meerkat array. So the Meerkat array will be integrated into that. Um, the maximum distance between the dishes is 150 kilometers um, and that corresponds to a to a total collecting area of 33,000 square meters. Um, and they, to, to get all of this data through, there's a very high, high um, data rates required. So um, the dishes will um, collect data and transfer it with um, the data rate of 8.8 terabits per second from the, so from the dishes to our, the first processing cluster. Um, and compared to, to to um, the JVLA, who's the, which is the, the, the currently best similar instrument that exists, um, it will have about four times the resolution and five times, and will be five times more sensitive than the JVLA. Um, and it's located in this little map of um, South Africa there. Um, I, I like this one because um, you can see how the, where most of the people are populated and where the, um, telescope is going to be where those green dots are. That the, the telescope positions in this map is, is not an accurate description of what it's actually going to be, but it's um, it's roughly the right place. You see how, how few people live around there, which is really important for radio astronomy because even though we can observe during the night or during the day and during all weather, we do have problems with man made. Um, signals so things like mobile phones cars electronics um all of those things will be interfering with radio radio um observations um so that's that's one of the things we do, try to build the telescopes as remote as possible so that you get 
as as little interference from from those things as possible. So that's the mid telescope. Um, then the the low telescope uh, is going to be built in Western Australia, similarly in a very remote location in, in the Shire of Murkinson. Um, there's basically no people living far out in the desert. Um, the low telescope, instead of building um, antenna, uh, sorry, instead of building dishes, we're going to build antennas, um, 130,000 of them. Uh, they're going to be spread between 512 stations. So each of those stations, that's like one that you can see up here. I don't know if you can see my mouse but up here, but under the, the collected together. Um, and there will be 500, 512 stations with 256 antennas in each. Um, and the reason we can build it that way is that the frequency range is very low. So from 50 megahertz to up to 350 megahertz. Um, so very long wavelength. And the maximum distance between two of those, the two of those stations is about 65 kilometers. And um, when you add it all up, the total collecting area is about 0 0.4 square kilometers. Um, also here, the, the transfer rates will be very high, 7.2 terabits per second from the antennas to the processor clusters. And um, here, if we compare to the best, the best um, telescope that is currently working at those frequencies, that's the low far telescope in the Netherlands, um, the SKA will be eight times more sensitive and have 25% better resolution. So this is once once it's all um, all finished and all and built. Um, so I mentioned really high um, data rates. So this is a little cartoon of how the telescopes and the backends will look. So the so as I said, the SK low telescope will have a 7.2 terabytes terabits per second data rate into what we call the CSP, which is the, the first step in the processing um, of the data. Um, in there, there will be either, there will be correlated, the signals will be correlated in there, so it'll be, and um, there will also be a beam former, which is what we use for, for pulsar observing, where we focus the signal into short, smaller beams. And most of the pulsar processing pipelines will sit in the central signal processor as well. And then um, after that, the data will go, there will be the first part of processing will be done in the CSP, it will move to another compute cluster that is more um, uh, used. The, the main task for it is to, to use the visibility data and make radio imaging. Um, so all the imaging pipelines will run on the same science data processing and some of our Pulsar and fast transient pipelines will run on there as well. Um, and then from there, um, the data will go out to what's called the SK regional centers, which will be located across the world um, in many different countries. And uh, that's where astronomers will be able to log in and get their data. Um, and they will have resources so, so astronomers can um, can work with the data at the regional center or they can download the data to their computers from there. Um, and at the bottom there, I've included the, the major dates. So you can see up until last year, um, there have been prototypes deployed. So as I said, at, at the SKA mid site in South Africa, there's a project called Meerkat. That's, it's a nascent telescope in its own right, but it's also going to be included into the SKA um, mid array. Um, and on the in the Western Australia is called telescope called MWA. That's the prototype and the, the precursor for for the low telescope. And then last year we started construction um, activities, so we we're now going. Um, the first commissioning observations will happen around 2024, and there will be a small proof of concept with just one or two dishes um, or um, antennas. Um, a small number of antennas, and then we'll build on from there. Um, and then science programs will come sometime after 2027, where we will be able to be ready to, to have astronomers on and um, 
use the telescopes. So there's a lot of um, science that you can do coming out of these telescopes. But um, these are all of the SKO science working groups and focus groups. So some of them are, are newer, they're called focus groups. Um, and some of them are science, science working groups. Um, and lots of astronomers from all across the world are included in, in work within these science working groups. Um, I've included the the web page there if you want to go and have a look if there's something specific you want to, to read about and look for um but there's a very very wide range of astronomy and and um that that goes into this um i'm not going to go and, and touch on all of these i mean it's going to point out the ones that so the ones that i am personally more involved in is it mainly the pulsar one um but also some of my my um background is for radio transients um, and you can use pulsars to um, study gravitational waves so that's, that's another application of pulsars that that will come into that um, working group so i'll i'll now swap gears a little bit and I'll, I'll tell you a bit about pulsars and what they are and what we can use them for um, and then i'll come back to the ska and, and um, how we can use the SK to observe pulsars. So, let me get this little video to work. Hopefully, it'll work for you. Anyway. Um, so, a pulsar is a neutral star. So, it was born in a uh, when a massive star collapsed uh, in a supernova remnant, in a supernova. Um, and they are rotating, um, and the beam of um, radiation. If it sweeps past our line of sight, we will see the emission as a pulse in our data with a large radio telescope. Um, we know of about 3,000 pulsars in our galaxy currently, um, and about 300 of those are what we call millisecond pulsars, which are the fastest and the, the um, most stable ones. And you can use pulsars to do a lot of different science. They can, they're very um, stable rotators, and we can use that um, to both find out things about neutron stars, but also about the environment that the pulsar is in. Um, so I listed a few things here. So of course, we can do neutron star population studies, so find out how many neutron stars there are in our galaxy, um, looking under, trying to understand what the emission of a, the, a pulsar is. Um, how it works, um, but a lot of pulsars are also in um, binary systems, other stars, um, and uh, then you can do binary star evolution. You can also look at it. some pulsars uh, are in uh, a binary system with another neutron star um, or uh, a white dwarf, and those you can use to um, to do um, tests of gravity. Um, there's also people involved in doing pulsar timing arrays, which uses the most um, stable, fastest pulsars, the millisecond pulsars, in a, uh, and use a lot of them distributed across the sky to try to detect a background of gravitational waves. Um, it can also study the stellar medium and then um, it's like super dense matter that would be inside of the inside of the neutron star, um, and of course supernova remnants. Some of them are still associated with supernova remnant when we observe them, um, and and other things. So so it's a wider range of science that you can use from finding a large number of pulsars. Um, so how do we do that? How do we find more pulsars? Um, there's a very large parameter space we'll need to search to find them. Um, firstly, they are distributed basically all across the sky. What you see on this um, graph in the middle is um, the sky distribution of, of the pulsars that we do know of. Um, around galactic latitude of zero is where we see the galactic plane. So there's most of the pulsars are um, located within our uh, own galactic plane. But we also see them above and beyond, and below the um, the plane, um, and the sky. 
sky. So if you want to find them all, you will have to search all of the sky. Um, you can also target specific areas with deeper so observations if you if you have a, an idea of where where to where to look. Um, so then we need to search in, in period space. So they're rotating, they have a very stable period. Um, but before we find them, we don't actually know what that period is. So the pearl that we do know of have spin periods that range from about just over a millisecond up to a few tens of seconds. So um, the slowest ones that we know of are about 70 or so seconds. So we need to search that, that whole period space. Um, and then because we don't know where in the galaxy they are, we also need to search in basically in distant space. Um, we, we call that dispersion measure space. So dispersion measure is um, how the signal interacts with the interstellar medium. So when the, the, the signal from a pulsar travels through the interstellar medium, it will interact with the free electrons that are um, in, in the interstellar medium. Um, and the, the signal that we see from the pulsar will be delayed um, more delayed at lower observing frequencies, not higher observing frequencies. Um, and it follows this little um, equation that you see there. So it's a, um, it's a quadratic um, ex expression. Um, the signal, we, because we don't know where they are, we'll have to search for uh, a lot of different values of this dispersion measure to be able to, um, to account for those ISM effects and, and find that that doesn't sneer a signal out. And then we also have to search in acceleration space, which is what we call um, it when we need to account for the binary motion. So if it, in a, a full star is in a close binary with another star, um, the signal basically goes through Doppler, the, the Doppler effect, the sort of Doppler motion. Um, and we need to account for that binary motion in the data. Um, Otherwise, that will also be a um, so, so there's a lot, it's a large parameter space, there's a lot of um, complex um, 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 algorithms that go into it. Um, so that's that's one of part of it. Um, so then when we found a large number of pulsars, um, if we only observe them once, we don't know that much about them, but um, then we'll go on to do something we call pulsar timing which is where we then know that there's a pulsar, we know maybe with spin period and it's dispersion measure, we can go back and observe it again, regular intervals. Um, and by doing that, we can make a model for the pulsar emission. So we can, uh, to very, very high precision, predict when each of the pulses come into the telescope. Um, and um, then we, by taking all of the rotational parameters and if they have any binary parameters, taking all of that into account, we can make a model for um, for the emission from that pulsar. Um, and then we can use that to improve the current model um, when we come observe, observe it the next time. Um, but we can also search for additional things that might be um, affecting the signal, such as, for example, a gravitational wave. And two of the the science drivers for the SK, so the largest science drivers is to do with pulsars. So one is to to use pulsars in a in a pulsar timing array to search for um, as a gravitational wave detector, um, and the other one is to use binary systems of pulsars to test general relativity and other theories of gravity. And finding a, a pulsar that orbits a, a black hole would be very very um, important thing, a very, a very good thing. Um, so we have a few pulsars that orbit other neutral stars. We don't know any that orbits a, a black hole just yet. That's one thing that all pulsar astronomers would like to find. Um, so then um, we also do something that we call single pulse search, um, where instead of searching for something that's periodic, we just search for single bursts of emission in the data. Um, and um, that's how, um, if you've heard of fast radio bursts, that's how they were um, discovered and that's how we still detect them now. Um, so fast radio bursts are uh, millisecond duration bursts of radio emission um, that are extra galactic. Most of the pulsars that we know are galactic. They're not very bright. We can't see them very far away. Um, the, but the fast radio bursts have been 
uh, both through the dispersion issue and also been localized to other galaxies outside of our own. And um, some of them are uh, have only been seen once and the people have been searching and trying to, to find them to repeat. Um, and they seem to sometimes only happen once, while others of them are repeating fast radio bursts, um, but without a stable periodicity. Um, so they're, they're not periodic, but they were at least not been found to be periodic yet. Um, we also search for, we can find things that are called uh, rotating radio transients that are similar to pulsars, but not quite as stable in the um, in their rotation, or uh, they don't might not um, emit on each rotation, so we don't can see a periodicity. That the uh, galactic sources just like pulsars, and we can also detect um, single pulses from pulsars. So if the extra bright pulses, not all pulses of each pulsar is have the same brightness. So sometimes they have what they call giant pulses that that they um, emit regularly, but some of the pulses are brighter. Um, and recently, people have used single pulsars to find really, really long period pulsars um, with both MeerKat and MWA that wouldn't we wouldn't be, al be able to find the periodic searches, or would be very difficult to find the periodic searches. Um, so radio interferometer is very useful when it comes to searching for these signals, especially fast radio bursts, because we have, I will show you in a second, we'll have lots of simultaneous beams um, with the telescope. So it means that we can, we can find out where they are in the sky instantly. Um, and to do this, it's very important um, to be able to follow these up in, in radio and in other wavelengths. It's very important that all of our processing is in real time so that we can um, send out a, a, a a message basically saying that we found something immediately and then other telescopes can, can follow it. So how will we then do all of the searching with um, the SK telescopes? So this is the, the SK low um, for four pulsars and fast transients. Rather than uh, making radio images, we will be forming what we call tide array beams. And if we were to use just one of the large, large single dish telescopes. We basically have one beam on the sky at any time. When we observe um, with one dish, there will be generally be one beam. Um, so one pixel basically that we see at the same time. Um, but with inter interferometer, we can form many beams, at the simultaneous beams. Um, so observe a, a larger range of the sky um, at the time. So with the low telescope, we were able to form 500 of these beams um, at the same time to do pulsar search and fast transient search. Um, and for pulsar timing, where we can go and observe a pulsar that we already know what the dispersion measure is. Um, I mean, so we can um, have, um, follow it up with pulsar timing. We can form up to 16 of those beams that's slightly different, um, that's slightly higher bandwidth. Um, and for the the mid telescope, um, instead we can we will be able to form fifteen hundred of those um, search beams simultaneously, uh, with a slightly wider bandwidth and a higher time resolution than at low. And for pulsar timing, we'll be able to do sixteen pulsars. So sixteen beams, meaning sixteen pulsars simultaneously, um, at a few different bands and very wide. So I just wanted to put up the slide of a, the, the team that we are um, at the, here in the UK and, and overseas. So it's the, we have a team PSS with the people working with the SKO to build the Pulsar Search backend um, for the SKA telescopes, um, led by uh, people at Ben Stafford at the University of Manchester and, and Iris Carcegio at, at the University of Oxford, um, and together with some industry partners. And then the Pulsar timing backend is built by people in um, Australia and New Zealand with the Fourier space. Um, okay. 
so the plans, observing modes and plans that we will do for pulsars with the SKA uh, is that we will use the PSS backend to perform real-time pulsar search and real-time fast transient search. Um, this is novel. This is new for the pulsar world where normally people um, would observe, astronomers would go to the telescope and they would observe and then they would save the data down to disk and then they would take it home and then they would um, process it as many times as they could and try to find everything they possibly could out of that data. But because of the large data rates, um, it's not going to be possible to do that. We're going to have to do some real-time processing um, of the data. Uh, for pulsar search and for pulsar transient, as I said, it's important both for data rates, but also for the, the uh, follow-up of the bursts being um, instant. Um, the transient search will also be commensals, meaning it can, it can run during other observing modes, not just when we run pulsar search. Um, and um, we will set up the pulsar search as an, as an all-sky survey. So it will be performed over a number of years by the Pulsar Science Working Group. Um, and the, there's a few different suggested parameters, but the, the current ones that we're working towards is that we will do an all-scale survey with SK mid-focusing galactic plane, and uh, then the lower SK low going to higher galactic latitudes and we'll be able to cover the sky a little bit quicker. There's some details on it that you probably don't need, but there's a, uh, Pulsar search, pulsar timing, sorry, will be a real time pulsar timing backend as well. Um, using something called coherent dispersion, which is um, in, uh, it, because we know what dispersion measure the pulsar is at, we can do it in directly on hardware, basically. Um, there's also two, we'll also be two modes at the pulsar timing backend where you can observe if you have a Want to do a targeted search um, that's very deep? Um, you can do that with those sixteen pulsar timing beams rather than the pulsar search backend, um, because um, you will be able to save a little bit more of that data down, and people, astronomers, will be able to get to that data on the on the regional centers um, rather than through real time um, processing. So there's a lot of challenges involved in this. Um, one of them is the high data rates. Um, the processing pipeline has to be run in real time and it's quite complex algorithms involved in it. Um, has a very high computational load. So um, that we're working hard on trying to get our backend very stable and all of the um, pipelines have to run flawlessly through um, because you can't go back after something has been observed and processed, um, it will be the data will be deleted, and we will be only have whatever comes out of our processing backend. Um, radio frequency interference mitigation, so getting rid of all of the man-made or satellite or other interference signals, um, will be really important. Um, both not to overload the, the system to get lots of false positive candidates out. Um, but also um, because we will get flooded by bad signals um, very quickly and the, the results might not come out as they should, um, particularly for fast transients where we can't afford to trigger other telescopes with um, um, false positives too often. And then we also conserving power consumption. It's important when you develop large systems like these that you try to find something that is um, power, um, low power systems. Um, so there's lots that goes into it. Um, I have some a, a few more details on slides. I'll go through it quite quickly. So I um, know how how um, interesting you to know all the details, but the so the pulsar search bit will sit inside what's called the central signal processor mainly so in the on, on each of the sites so one site in uh, south africa and one in 
um, Western Australia, there will be this um, compute, uh, one central signal processor and one science data processor center. And in the central signal processor, the we will have the, the beam former for the for the pulsar work and time domain um, modes, and also the correlator uh, for the visibility data for the radio imaging. Um, so in, in the central signal processor, there will be dedicated computer clusters for the pulsar search backends and the pulsar timing backends. Um, but it won't do too much more with the visibility data that's correlated. Then the, the data will move into this um, science data processor where most of the imaging pipelines will sit and make the radio imaging data. Uh, we'll also have some pulsar search processing and, and some samples and pulsar timing processing in there as well. And then out from the science data processor will come the data that will actually go to the two astronomers across the world and the um, SKB email centers. So that, that's where people will be able to, to work on their data that they um, co collected and, um, and, and get access to, to it all. Okay, so then um, if you're interested in, in processing pipelines, this is a, uh, just a, a quick diagram showing what we will do with the different um, modes. So pulsar timing. So as I said, you can make, you can observe 16 pulsars at the same time. So for pulsar timing, we will do some uh, interference RFI mitigation within the CSP. Um, and then we'll do what we call coherent dispersion, which is removing the, the dispersion from the signal. And then we'll fold the signal to increase the signal noise value of the, of the um, detection. Uh, so we'll do that on, on the, signal central signal processor and then the actual timing bit will happen on the science data processor um where we'll calibrate the data and create what we call t ways which is time arrivals for each of the pulse in the data um and we will then update the timing model there and then after that send that out to to the socs and um there will also be two other modes on the pulsar timing um cluster that will be able to do coherent dispersion, but create basically search data that astronomers can search afterwards um, on the SRCs for if they want to do deeper searches than, than the pulsar search backend can do. So that's the that's the PST backends. Um, the PSS backend, so this is pulsar search backends. Um, this is just a summary of the things that are, I, I think most of these things have already said, but for SK mid, we will have 1500 beams simultaneously in SK low will have 500 beams. Um, so from the beam form, we will move into the, the, the central signal processor. So we will do this D dispersion and the acceleration search. And we will sift through the candidates and remove duplicates. And then uh, we'll do what we call folding to, to make um, the to increase signal noise. And this, this is the main part that we're working on currently um to get the this particular csp pipeline working um to go in real time and to um to fit all of the the um trials of dispersion and acceleration in that we that we need to be able to fit in so i have a little um diagram where you can see uh, the main point to take from this is that it's it's really high competition load for each beam um we will you they would take about more than 10 peta ops so 10 million um the, 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 yeah 10,000 tera ops 10 million giga ops um so it's it's uh, computationally very expensive and uh it's hard to to get it to run as fast as it needed um, so it, it takes a lot of effort, basically. Um, so out of this pipeline, then will be we will get what we call pulsar candidates. So from each of the beams, we will be able to get uh, up to a thousand candidates, um, and then also single pulse candidates, a transient candidate, and then they will go into this science data processor where they will be um, compared between the, these fifteen hundred or five hundred beams. We'll be able to see. Um, if there's anything 
that's clearly an interference signal, maybe it shows up in all of the beams, so we can remove that. Um, so that's the multi-beam coincidence matching. And then there will be some machine learning code sitting on STP, um, going through all of these candidates and trying to rank them and classify them uh, and make a selection of what it thinks is the real or uh, what's just noise. And then it will send a trigger to the telescope manager if if a transient or a pulsar is, is ranked highly enough. Um, and then uh, there, all of the candidates will be sent to the to regional centers. Um, there will also be a transient buffer sitting at the telescopes. So once a detection of a, a fast transient has happened and we trigger the telescope manager, the telescope manager can then go and, and um, trigger the transient buffer to be saved on each of the dishes. Um, and it can do that so that we can then go back afterwards and um, analyze the, the um, uh, signal in more detail, basically. Um, so it can, it can save some of that um, data, the raw data, then if, if there's a detection happen, happening. Okay, so that's um, that's the whole processing flow. Um, so so we're hoping to use this to find find a large range of full size, um, and um, I have some predictions for what we think we will be able to find with the SKA. Um, so this is um, some numbers for a pulsar survey with the currently um, funded SKA. So as 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 um, the, the telescope that we're currently building. Um, so we currently know of about 3,000 pulsars um, of them, about three or 400 millisecond pulsars. Um, so this particular simulation that I did, um, I assumed that we would do an all sky survey with the two telescopes combined. So low would observe the higher galactic latitudes and mid would observe the lower so along the galactic plane and there would be some overlap between the two surveys to make sure that we could recover everything properly um, and um, if we combine all of this we would get about 9,000 ordinary pulsars that we can or pulsars that we would be able to find with the SK telescope and 1200 MSPs so millisecond pulsars then um, so this that's for for the telescope that that we will be building and that will come align in a few years. Um, there's also um, unfunded suggestions for how to expand the telescope if it if it's indeed successful and if, if it's working. Um, so the original SK was slightly larger than the one that we're currently building for funding constraints. So this was uh, this is a an estimate of what or a simulation of what we could detect if we were to actually get a square kilometer um, collection area. Um, so this is a very similar survey, but with higher um, sensitivity of the telescope, basically. So if we were to get a full scale SKA, um, we would be able to discover about 27,000 ordinary pulsars and 5,000 millisecond pulsars. Which is amazing numbers, and it's it's um, getting towards in some directions in the galaxy. We would basically run out of so we would be able to detect them all um, with a telescope like that. So um, I saw the summary. Um, so we've started constructing the telescopes. They will be built the, in a few years' time, um, and they will be very very good for a lot of astronomy particularly for, for, I'm very happy that it will be very, very good for pulsar astronomy. Um, and just some, some of the details there would do in all survey in real time, and we will be able to perform transient searches in real time and mentally without a project. Um, and the predictions for the telescopes in a combined survey with the telescope, with the, both the low and the mid array, would give us about 9,000 ordinary pulsar samples, I admit this piece, which is, large numbers and hopefully some really exciting um, special systems would be within those those 9,000 pulsars. 
I'm going to stop there. Thank you.